I would like to start with a, actually with two questions which might help us a little bit to understand the historical and social background of the people at the time of, of Charles Darwin. Um, what, I, what I saw was what came up to my mind as being a layperson in this, in this field. Um, I was thinking about how did it come about that science became an antagonist, uh, um, uh, a force of doubt towards uh, religion. While when, when we look at the time of enlightenment, we see there is um, a kind of skepticism, historic critical methods of interpreting history and Bible. We see that all these discussions are from the realm of philosophy and theology. And um, mostly they have been discussed in the field of scholars, not in the field of the, of the general public. And um, so where were the breaking point or how did it come about that from science we came to, uh, from, from theology and philosophy, we came to science as, as, as a force of doubt? And maybe just adding secondly also, how did it come that this became part of, of a general discussion? The Copernican um, turnaround, Copernican um, revolution uh, didn't affect the normal peasant who was glad that the sun came up and the sun came down, but didn't care much about who turns around who. So all of a sudden it became important for people in the middle of society. So these two parts would be interesting to hear if you could elaborate a little bit on that. I'll try. It's a complicated story, um, but one critical thing is that the period during which Darwin was developing his ideas was a period during which there was a massive increase in popular literacy. So when books get published that are written with a more general audience in mind, and of course such books would be more likely to sell than highly specialised works, um, it meant there was a much larger audience for scientific texts. Now, I can only speak with any great authority on the English scene, but there's an interesting example of this in a whole series of books published in the 1830s. And these are books that were designed as the product of a, a, a bequest um, from the will of person we call the Earl of Bridgewater. A series of books was commissioned to discuss the various natural sciences and what each of them could say about religion and particularly about how each science might best display the origin of the beauty in the world the great power and wisdom of God. That's the traditional uh, way in which science had been done in England, often by clergymen who in their spare time would go out looking at beetles <laughs> uh, and, and observing with great acumen details of the natural world. Eight volumes appeared they're called the Bridgewater Treatises. What is interesting about that series of books is that they were written at a level that a general audience could understand. What's even more interesting is that because they were showing how you could place a religious construction on the latest scientific news, they actually functioned as introductory scientific texts for that more general audience, even though their primary intention was to show how science still supported belief in God. So they, they illustrate, in a sense, a transitional state where the expansion of science and what I think one has to say is a very gradual professionalization of science led 
to higher standards, higher details, higher criteria for establishing scientific truth than had existed, shall we say, in the 18th century. And the person who illustrates that best is Thomas Henry Huxley, whom you saw on the slide. Because Huxley fights the corner of an emerging group of scientists who complain, Huxley certainly complained, that science may bring you honour in England, but it doesn't bring you cash. You can't actually earn a living from it. And Huxley felt that there were professional standards, there ought to be recognition that scientists were experts in their field and they should be listened to. And so there is a movement, and it's a cultural movement, to greater autonomy and power for scientists themselves in a society that had been dominated by the church, by the universities of Oxford and Cambridge, which in many respects had been training grounds for the ministry. That's a long answer, and we've hardly started, but I'm going to stop there, uh, because those, I think, give you a few pointers to what was actually happening in society. But that move to greater literacy helps to understand, I think, how some of these issues became both assimilated and fought over in, in a wider public arena. I found this expression by Aubrey Moore very, very interesting. Um, you mentioned that he said, Darwin liberated Christianity. And would it be possible to explain this a little bit more? This includes. Moore knew, of course, that Darwin's theory had caused a lot of trouble in the church. But he felt that a lot of that was based on a model of God's relationship to nature, which was actually seriously out of date. It's seriously out of date because it was that, sometimes it's been called semi-deism, that view that the, the world is basically fixed and it's fixed like my watch or a clock that the universe runs like clockwork, God who set up the clockwork, and it just goes on and on and on. You find that view to some degree in Isaac Newton's writings, where you get the idea that God is only acting in nature when intervening in the machinery of the way nature is working. And I think Moore is saying, really, that is not a Christian view. Christian doctrine requires that God be a constant presence in nature. The doctrine of the incarnation is a doctrine in which God manifests himself in, in the world. We should be thinking, says Moore, of a more immanent view of how God's spirit is acting in nature. And this is where he thinks Darwin has been a friend to Christianity because it provides the basis for a return to a more truly biblical understanding of a God who is present in everything not just when there is some intervention from outside the clockwork. That's what lies behind it, I think. The idea of intervention plays, and the definition of intervention plays an important role there as well. Yes. Andreas, may I bring you in here with this question as well? Um, do you have something to add to this point from the theological point of view? Was it? <laughs> 
to the question if Darwin was a gift to Christianity, his findings. Yeah, I think this is a big question. <laughs> and on the one hand, I think if he, we find out something about nature, for me as a theologian, this is how creation works. And then I have to accept it and find the beauty in it somehow. When, when it says that God says to the to the, everything that's created, it's very good, I need to find out why it's very good. Sometimes it's not at the first hand good to see that it's really good. And that's, that's a challenge, I think. And then there's the aspect, which you pointed out already, that it, it shows that creation is something dynamic. It's very much like the statement of Kingsley, that's... <laughs> The world is created to make itself, so to say. And this is um, that it shows the creativity of the earth. And this demonstrates for me that it's also possible to interpret scripture sometimes with a different eye, a different perspective. And we shouldn't be too fixed in the what we perceived, how we understood scripture. Maybe sometimes something a different aspect demonstrates itself and shows us that uh, it can be viewed differently. So in this case, the creativity of the earth is all, was already always there in the biblical narrative, but it was not seen as much. And uh, it was the focus was that everything was created a, a, according to his species, with different species. Well, different species are important. I just mentioned biodiversity, but um, um, the question is how we read the Bible, and I think. We already had the Galileo evening where we found out that it's for Galileo it was an issue as well. How we read the Bible, um, that it makes us, um, gives us a possibility to have a fresh view of, of our basis. Okay. Uh -huh. Thanks a lot. Well, I, I just put, a, put one on top of you. <laughs> now, um, the, the title of this lecture is Stout. Do David's findings stout towards your beliefs? Um, yes, but I think doubt is necessary to really truly believe. If we wouldn't doubt, we couldn't believe. We would just have a false security. So I think to 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 get a deeper belief, we need to doubt, and that's where David helps me. Keep it short this time. Mm -hmm. Great. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> Very interesting thought. I We'll speak about this further. <laughs> no, that's very interesting. <laughs> uh, coming back to you, Dr. Brook, uh, you stressed that Darwin on several occasions stressed in one or the other way or made it clear that he doesn't see himself as an atheist. Um, why do you think it was so important to him to, to make this so clear? Well, views do differ on this, and I hinted that there is the view that he states that he'd never been an atheist because that's what many people would hope he believed. Um, but I don't think that he deliberately tried to conceal his own beliefs to that degree because I don't think he's a dishonest person. Um, the question how important it is to him Hard to judge. I think it can best be seen um, perhaps in, in the statement that comes very close to where he says, I suppose I deserve, I deserve to be called a theist. When he says, I, I just cannot imagine how this wonderful universe with all its richness, with all its diversity, with all its gifts, could simply have been the result of chance. I think that ultimately has to be some ground of the, as it were, the, the wonder, the magnificence of nature which contains very cruel things, for sure. But there's somewhere very, very interesting, particularly in that section where he's talking about pain and suffering um, and, and how hurtful there are many memories he has because of 
death and his own family. Um, I, I, I think that when he reflects on so much of, na of nature, he is really struck by the most awe-inspiring details, however they have emerged, whether through evolution, whether by some creative fiat, though he doesn't really entertain that. But he's thinking of something like the beauty of an orchid and how the orchid fertilizes itself. This is a wondrous thing. There is in nature something, many things, that are awe-inspiring. And I think that leads him, it leads him to believe there is, there is that serious question of how this world could be as it is without some transcendent creator. But as I say, that is a controversial question. I tend to favour Darwin's honesty. Um, over those who think that he is just doing his best to ensure that it's a good sell. Um, so th there is an issue. Coming back to you, Andres, I, when I read some of your um, essays, I found that you favor athe atheism in science, but you make a very interesting differentiation. Could you, could you explain this a little bit? Yeah, well, I think science needs a methodological atheism. So they cannot use God as an explanation in science because I mean, from a theological point of view, everything is created and sustained by God. So you would find God always. So it would be always the same answer. And this is not how science works. So that's why I think um, even from a theological point of view, it's important to say science cannot work with God. And if it's used only in some cases, it's always this god of the gaps, uh, the lacunas, as you call it, which, um, which is sort of, maybe it tells us something about the limits of our knowledge, but it doesn't tell us much about God, because then God would be a deus ex machina, always chiming in when we don't have another explanation. And, but uh, this is not the same as a metaphysical atheism. That would say that there is no God, and scientists can have work godless in their method while believing in God, of course. There are many, I mean, it's, it's a different distribution and maybe one third who believe in God, one third who are indiscerned and one third who are atheists. And um, so all is possible and it doesn't, the one thing doesn't um, imply the other necessarily. Perhaps I could just say something there because there is a very interesting book written by an an English philosopher, um, John Gray, and the book is called Seven Types of Atheism. Seven Types of Atheism. That means, I think, there must be at least seven types of agnosticism. Um, and and well, we could spend the whole evening here going through inventing those seven cases, but I, I agree with what and Andres was saying there. There are things you have to assume just in the normal practice of science and to invoke the deity um, as part of your scientific research program, frankly, just sounds silly these days and it certainly does to pretty well all scientists. Um, so I think one does have to be careful. In, in that. Normally we would say science is here on one side, they have their field and they have their um, tools, how they work. And on the other side, there's belief and this is its field. And there's a sharp distinction between this, these two fields. But with both of you, I found in your writings and in the um, other things I read from you and from you, um, that you led for, that, that you find this distinction not very helpful. Um, at least this sharp border. Could you a little bit explain that? I think the clearest statement of that sharp 
division that you've mentioned was probably made by um, the American evolutionary biologist Stephen Jay Gould. He wrote a book called Rocks of Ages in which he claimed that a lot of damage had been done by attempts to intermingle scientific issues with theological interpretation. Uh, and really, the best way of securing peace along that border between science and religion was to keep the mag magisteria of each separate. And he became associated with the acronym N-O-M-A, No Overlapping Magisteria. If you mix your religion and your science, you are in great danger of bringing the house down. It looks like a neat way of creating space for both. It doesn't work historically because there has been a lot of entanglement, which I think is a good word to use, a lot of entanglement between scientific and religious thinking historically. There is not so much today, but science in our own generation has raised so many difficult questions that it cannot itself answer. Within science itself, you cannot get solutions to the ethical problems and many of the dilemmas we face today. And so for somebody to bring in an interpretation that is informed by their religion can actually be quite constructive. And I can think of lots of contexts where there is not a kind of formal entanglement, but there is a way in which religious perspectives, religious understandings can help in the understanding and interpretation of science. Just as, as I mean, we haven't faced head on the question over the authority of, of the Bible, but the Bible can enrich our understanding of many human problems and how we should behave to each other. What it doesn't do, and I think Stephen Jay Gould is right on this, you should not try to deduce scientific truth from scripture. It's just something that's going to land you in the soup. Uh, it, 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 it's just, it leads to just so much distress, so much vapid and vacuous debate. Um, let the authority of scripture stand on the moral and spiritual state and, and, and what it teaches. And then I think one can create some space for both. Thanks a lot. Andreas? Well, I think Stephen Jay Gould is on one hand very right. It needs to be separated, science and religion. It shouldn't be intermingled in a conflicting way, because then you, of course, have um, differences. But when you separate it and enter a dialogue between the two fields, then you can exchange arguments and ideas. And then it's possible that you integrate some of the ideas in your own fields. Theology, of course, can integrate scientific ideas, but even science can pick up theological ideas like it happened with Big Bang Theory. And um, so this way, I think it's actually a circle of, um, of exchange that's possible throughout the decades and centuries that there is an um, interaction between science and religion, which is possible, but an important stage in this dialogue is, of course, to uh, respect the, uh, the difference of the other field and not to 
talk into the other area where you're not an expert. But then if the other expert thinks you have maybe interesting ideas, then it's up to them to use them. You mentioned the word respect. With huge respect to our um, audience, I would also like to open up this discussion if there are any questions from your side. I wondered what you, what you would make of the last uh, 15, 50 years of discoveries, scientific discoveries. It seems like uh, Darwin was not right with everything he said. Can I just say that I think Darwin himself would have been astonished by the thought that he was associated with beliefs that would not change. I mean, he, he, he's very open and humble about that. You know, he said, I, I quite expect my views um, may be developed. So there is a distinction perhaps that's helpful here. Um, and it, it relates to the impact of Darwin's thinking. There was a lot of controversy about whether natural selection was a sufficient mechanism for producing a whole evolutionary story, we might say. But it's generally agreed, certainly by historians of science, that what Darwin did do, whatever, whatever doubts people may have had about the detailed mechanism of the process, whatever doubts they might have had, the evidence for the fact of evolution, the fact that there had been these evolutionary processes at work, that was his undoubted contribution. And within a very short space of time, that fact, in inverted commas, because as you know, ultimately all facts have to go in inverted commas, but um, there, there, there is a, a very real sense in which the impact of Darwin unequivocally was to demonstrate the credibility of belief in evolution. Even though you could quarrel over natural selection, as many did, it's not really until the 1930s that natural selection is kind of reinstated into what became known as the new synthesis. Currently, there are all those trends you have mentioned. Things that I think Darwin would be incredibly excited by. But to say that there are trends that require us to acknowledge that he was wrong on some things, that would not surprise him at all. In fact, I think he might actually be rather pleased because it would show that his work is still the basis of important discussion in, in the sciences. I would have to return to our key question that we always put at the end of these uh, lectures to our, um, to our lecturers and people who are here. The question, is there more to humankind, more to human being than stardust? What do you think? I think language which says that we are nothing but something is hideously awful language and is usually fulfilling some kind of obvious rhetorical purpose. Um, we are not nothing but things. Um, we have minds which are capable of the most astonishing feats. Um, we know that perfectly well from the rate at which technological change is occurring today. To pretend you can simply reduce human creativity to bits of matter dashing about in the brain 
that seems to me a very impoverished view of humankind. So it's, for me, it's a very simple answer to your question. Um, no, we are not nothing but stardust. Andreas, you have answered this already once, but would you like to add? Are we more than stardust? Um, yeah, sure, because stardust is a beautiful expression, I think, of the interconnectedness of our matter. But we are also, as you said, mind. We have mind, there is mind. This is a phenomenon which is even more amazing. So uh, there is more than stardust in some sense. On the other, in the other sense, it's deeply connected. Biblically, it's we are always matter. It's there's no lofty spirit mm -hmm. separated from matter. So yeah, 